In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. It's been rightly said at the end of every religious question, there's always a why that no reasoning settles, and to which there's but one single but admirable answer, God's infinite love for us. Revelation puts us in the presence of a divine fact, a truth. It does not solve the how, but it tells the why, which is that God has loved us exceedingly. God created us because he loves us. Christ became incarnate and died on the cross because he loves us. Our Lord instituted the Holy Eucharist because he loves us. He gave us a Catholic Church and the sacraments because he loves us. Almighty God desires that we all be with him in heaven because he loves us. All God does is out of love. There's nothing in the world sweeter than to know how much God loves us. God desires our love to such an extent that in his mind the whole plan of creation is centered about it. To create angels and human beings in order to lavish his love upon them and to be loved by them in return. And when human beings were taken away from him by original sin, he could not endure the thought of losing their love. So he sent his own son as a redeemer to recapture their love. The incarnation, the humiliations and sufferings of our Lord, the precious blood of Jesus, the death of Christ, there is the incomprehensible price which he consented to pay for our love. And all that we do, he only expects, he only values love. His sole desire is love, more love, always love. That is all he asks of us. Of its very nature, love demands a return of love between husband and wife, parents and their children, between our best friends, between ourselves and God. Therefore, since God's love for man demands union with our love, and because the difference between God and our soul is so vast, God found it necessary to bridge that separation. With an incredible embasement, he descended to our level so we can in some way conceive the infinite grandeur of God. He assumed human nature, taking on a body and soul like ours, sharing in our human feelings and love, suffering our sorrows, knowing our infirmities, and living our life so he could die for our redemption. All this in order to win our love. This is beautifully expressed in the preface of Christmas, that while we acknowledge him to be God seen by men, we may be drawn by him to the love of things invisible. With all this proof of God's love for us, our hearts have no excuse to doubt his love or refuse our love to God. My dearly beloved in Christ, in 1673, our Lord expressed his great desire to be loved by us when he appeared to a visitation nun, St. Margaret Mary, pleading the case for the love of his most sacred heart. He revealed that his heart, which loves men so tenderly and which has poured out every drop of its blood for the welfare of our souls, is met with indifference, coldness, neglect, and even hatred. And showing St. Margaret Mary his sacred heart, our Lord said, Behold this heart which has so loved men that it has spared nothing, even to exhausting and consuming itself, in order to testify its love. In return, I receive from the greater part only in gratitude by their irreverence and sacrilegious and by the coldness and contempt they, for, they have for me in the sacrament of love. My dearly beloved in Christ, in Christ's apparitions to St. Margaret Mary, he requested that she reveal to Catholics his desire for increased devotion to his sacred heart in order to make reparation for man's ingratitude, especially manifested by indifference to the Holy Eucharist. And then he told St. Margaret Mary that he should be honored under the figure of this heart of flesh and its image should be exposed. He promised that wherever an image of his sacred heart should be exposed with the view to show its special honor, he would pour forth his 
blessings and graces. And St. Margaret Mary said, This devotion was the last effort of his love that he would grant to men in these latter ages in order to withdraw them from the empire of Satan, which he desired to destroy, and to thus introduce them into the sweet liberty of the rule of his love, which he wished to restore into the hearts of all those who should embrace his devotion. And he promised, among other things, to establish peace in their homes. My dearly beloved in Christ, those who really do not understand divine love because they have only a hesitant, weak faith will not respond to the merciful call of Christ. Some may begin with fervor to make the nine First Friday commitment in order to get the promises attached, but will soon allow their fervor to cool rather than increase their love for God, which this devotion is supposed to inspire. Missing the essence of the message, they, after completing the nine First Fridays, feel that their job is done. First Fridays are no longer of importance to them, nor do they remember to continue forms of reparation for all the abuses which Christ's loving heart daily receives. My dearly beloved in Christ, much more so in our day than ever before, Christ is blasphemed, his cross is reviled, and his church ridiculed. So many have forgotten what Jesus has done for them. They lack generosity, gratitude, and love, and have selfishly followed their own whims instead of the will of God. In closing, St. Thomas Aquinas says, Devotion is nothing else but the will to give oneself readily to things concerning the service of God. Thus, if we sincerely mean to follow devotion to the Sacred Heart, we will not limit it to nine First Fridays and then forget the essence of it. Instead, this devotion will lead us to obedience to God's laws and to the laws of the Church, to fulfillment of the duties in our state and life, to prayer and to a true love of the Sacred Heart. And if we sincerely serve God with love, we will find that He will fulfill His promises above and beyond what our poor efforts deserve, for He is never outdone in generosity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.